story of the balloon is filled with unbridled romance and uncanny resilience. How else can you explain why an unsteerable, lighter than air bag with no brakes, a basket, and no way to propel itself is so compelling to watch and even more popular to fly? Ballooning is a, a mystery to even balloonists themselves. Balloons are a symbol of freedom, whether they're high altitude, long duration gas balloons or low altitude, short duration hot air balloons. They defy the grip of gravity. They are unrestrained. Balloons are just air particles. Uh, they do absolutely nothing that the weather doesn't uh, uh, make them do. For centuries, the balloon has provided those pioneers brave enough to travel where the weather takes them with the possibilities to exploit their dreams. The balloon is the free spirit of air travel. You go where the wind tells you to go, and so therefore the, the control you have with the balloon is very minimal. It's going to go wherever the wind is going. Balloons are the most natural, I think, way to fly in the air, and flying in the air is just a wonderful, wonderful thing to do. On a cold morning in March of 1999, Team Breitling was busy preparing their balloon for one of aviation's oldest dreams and ultimate challenges, to fly non-stop around the world by balloon. For more than a decade, a handful of long-distance balloonists had tried and failed to circumnavigate the globe. Forced down by the inevitable pull of Earth's gravity, fickle winds, and material failures. But the balloon has always been a public relations bonanza, and the round-the-world attempts galvanized the public's attention. A balloon is kind of a universal fun symbol, a universal adventure symbol, and it, everyone just loves a balloon. The adventure became a rare test of raw nerves, scientific ingenuity, and lucky breaks. This time, Breitling pilots Brian Jones and Bertrand Picard would fly a balloon that was as tall as the Leaning Tower of Pisa and weighed as much as a fighter plane. What's interesting is that other than its size and the materials used to make it, the basic design of their balloon has remained fundamentally unchanged for more than 200 years. Man has dreamed of flying through the air for thousands of years, but it wasn't until 1783 that the Montgolfier brothers demonstrated the first balloon to rise under its own power, hot air. Since hot air is lighter than cold air, hot air held in an enclosed bag or envelope will rise. Their first balloons were made out of paper. They were not particularly the right shape because they were just learning, but they were just paper envelopes and they would hold them over a fire and they would fill with hot air and when they let go of the paper, they'd fly away. Glue wasn't very available in those days, so when they had to transport the balloon, uh, they couldn't just crumple it up in a bag as we do today with uh, flexible fabrics. Uh, they had to assemble the balloon, and they did it with buttons and buttonholes. The first man flight was made by Francois Pilatre de Rosier, who flew the Montgolfier's paper and cloth hot air balloon for almost 25 minutes before a fire forced him down. They did catch him fire. Part of the equipment was, uh, was long poles, with a sponge on the end of it. And when a spark would glow up and start a fire in the envelope, they dumped the sponge in the bucket of water and put the fire out. In December of 1783, French chemist J.A. Charles made the first man flight in a balloon filled with hydrogen gas, a newly discovered source of lift that is seven times lighter than air. Charles was using silk uh, because the hydrogen uh, a molecule is so much smaller than an air molecule, and they would coat the silk with tree sap to make it non-porous. By 1785, in an effort to extend the length of flight, de Rosier tried to combine both sources of lift into one balloon. Using an open fire, hot air rose up the cylinder to warm hydrogen, which made the gas even lighter. Unfortunately, hydrogen is highly flammable, and the Rosier balloon blew up shortly after takeoff. The first man to fly in a balloon was also the first man to die in a balloon. 
From then on, balloonists did not mix hydrogen and hot air. They used only hydrogen gas and later non-flammable helium for lift. As soon as the gas balloon came out, the hot air balloon was obsolete. It could only make short flights. Uh, it seemed to be hazardous, taking fire aloft and everything. So the hot air balloon just disappeared, and it was gas ballooning um, uh, until the uh, turn of the century. Ironically, 214 years after man's first hot air balloon flight, it was a Rosier-style balloon that would be the first to fly nonstop around the world. Because balloons sink at night when temperatures drop and gas cools and rise again during the day when the sun expands the gas, a constant source of lift is needed to keep the balloon at an altitude with favorable winds. In a Rosier balloon, a large pocket of non-flammable helium enclosed above is warmed by a separate cone-shaped bag of hot air generated by burning propane below. The challenge for pilots is to negotiate changing altitudes while keeping the helium and propane from running out. For balloonists, the ultimate dream became a reality on March 21, 1999, when the Breitling Orbiter 3 completed the 29,000-mile journey around the world in just under 20 days at an average speed of 60 miles per hour. Everybody wanted to be first, and a lot of people have quit because they said they wanted to be first or not do it. But you know somebody's going to say, 20 days, I can do better than that, and they're going to try. Long before the balloon was utilized to satisfy man's competitive nature, it was employed as an instrument of war. As early as 1794, the French used tethered balloons to scout the movements of enemy troops. Never before had soldiers been able to observe battle from such a vantage point. Tethered balloons were also used in the American Civil War to map battlegrounds and direct artillery. At altitudes of 500 feet, observers could see almost 25 miles. In 1861, Thaddeus Lowe, an early aeronaut for the Union, made a historic and rare free flight in a balloon over Confederate positions. He was actually able to return to Union territory on a fortuitous high-altitude current. In 1870, balloons were the only link to the outside world during the Franco-Prussian War. With all ground communication cut off, 66 balloons carried more than 100 people and 2.5 and million letters out of Paris. Here's World War I. No gas generator in sight. The hydrogen is forced under high pressure into cylinders, which can then be stored or carried almost anywhere. While powered steerable balloons with interior skeletons or rigid airships ruled the air in 1917, the ground-based round balloon was replaced by a more stable sausage shape suitable for higher altitudes. Armed with more sophisticated communication systems, Balloonists were released by winches to elevations of 6,000 feet or more to relay enemy positions. While these balloons were highly effective at spying, few positions were as frightening as that of the balloon's pilot in the face of enemy gunfire. If gunfire didn't get him, fire from a highly flammable hydrogen gas balloon would. So under attack, the balloonists' only recourse was to bail out and parachute to safety. By the end of the war, the manned balloons were down, but not out. At the beginning of World War II, the Japanese hoped to set huge forest fires in the United States by launching balloons carrying incendiary bombs. Made of paper or silk, the Japanese launched an estimated 9,000 bomb-carrying balloons. Only 285 reached the United States and caused minimal damage. Perhaps the most successful use of balloons in war was the unmanned barrage balloon. Anchored by steel cables, these 70,000 cubic foot rubberized cotton balloons formed an impenetrable aerial picket line. Instead of the cable remaining taut and possibly breaking or slipping off the wing of the plane, it pulls free, and a parachute system pulls a bomb right onto the plane. Barrage balloons were capable of flying up to 20,000 feet, forcing enemy aircraft to drop their bombs well out of range of American targets at sea. Balloonists risked their lives for science well before they risked their lives in war. Scientists of all kinds were among the first professionals to exploit the potential of the balloon, in part to dispel popular myths of flight. 
people were very superstitious in those days, and they thought if you left the ground, you'd die. Uh, so they sent up a, a rooster, a sheep, and a duck. And uh, they flew, they landed, they ran over to the balloon, they were all in one piece, so they said it's okay. After that, the insatiable curiosity of the scientific aeronauts changed the way we viewed the world forever. They all had their own agendas, and they all had their own goals and objectives, but uh, the, the three things they had in common was uh, smarts, guts, um, and iron will. In 1862, meteorologist James Glacier and Henry Coxwell made several balloon flights above 20,000 feet. Among their discoveries was the jet stream, a high-speed current of air that circles the Earth between layers of atmosphere. On July 11, 1897, Swedish aeronaut Solomon Andre and two colleagues attempted to fly a 170,000 cubic foot silk balloon to the North Pole in an effort to learn more about the climate in which they lived. In a message received by Carrier Pigeon four days later, all was well, but the crew was never heard from again. Their remains and these pictures were not discovered until 1930. That same year, Swiss physicist Auguste Picard began working on a pressurized gondola, an enclosed system designed to reuse its own supply of air at high altitude. This system was the forerunner to the one used by his grandson, Bertrand Picard, the first balloonist to fly around the world. In 1931, Auguste Picard was interested in studying cosmic rays. To do that, he not only needed his own pressurized air supply, but he needed a balloon, a big one. The envelope was made of static-free rubberized cotton and weighed 1,600 pounds. On two occasions, the 500,000 cubic foot balloon hoisted Picard and his aluminum gondola above 50,000 feet, almost 10 miles into the sky. I believe the New York Times had an editorial in the 30s that described the high altitude pioneers of the 30s as Vikings of the air. And that's very much um, the, the motivation for some of these guys. They wanted to be out there on the leading edge and be the first to see these things. With bigger balloons and pressurized capsules, the sky soon became a limitless research laboratory. One of the most exciting and neglected chapters in aviation history was about to begin. The piece of hardware that was really crucial uh, that made the, the 50s high altitude balloon projects possible was the invention of new um, materials for balloon envelopes, specifically plastic and polyethylene. It seems quite flimsy, but it is really quite strong. And it will hold air or helium. The new plastic balloon material, which was as thin as a dry cleaning bag, was exposed to temperatures of 100 degrees below zero, as well as the direct rays of the sun. This material represented a quantum leap in scientific balloon design. Once you got into polyethylene, you had incredibly strong, incredibly light material and you could extrude it in, in long gores of, of material that you can make a huge balloon capable of holding millions of cubic feet of helium. Larger, lighter, stronger balloons meant heavier scientific payloads and higher flights. And higher flights meant man was on his way into space. Well, they absolutely were the first step into space. The uh, polyethylene balloon came along at the right time because it was, it was a very inexpensive way to gather the knowledge and the data that we needed. Man, I was an Air Force project, and the goal of the project from the very beginning was to raise a human being above 100,000 feet, 20 miles above the surface of the Earth, leave him there, bring him back down safely. But which man would they send, and who had the right stuff? before we knew what the right stuff was. I was a fighter pilot and I was an experimental test pilot and I volunteered for every uh, interesting project that came along. The man chosen for the first man-high stratospheric balloon flight was Air Force test pilot Joe Kittinger. When I went from a supersonic F-100 to a subsonic balloon, it was quite a transition. It's a game between you and the elements on, on how you steer a balloon, but you, you can't go any faster than what the wind is, and you go the same direction that the wind is going in. He was a brilliant man, a very gutsy man, and he was willing to take on assignments that, uh, that no one else wanted to do. The Man Eye Capsule was really a testament to what we call sort of bootleg shirt sleeves research. 
This thing was essentially an aluminum can with a door on the front. It really was held together with, uh, with, with bailing wire and uh, um, there was cardboard to keep the sun from shining in the, in the pilot's eyes. It was, uh, it was remarkably low tech. The gondola, which measured three feet by seven feet and weighed more than 2,000 pounds, was minute compared to the balloon, which had a capacity of two million cubic feet. On takeoff, the balloon was about 35 foot across, but as the balloon goes aloft and the pressure decreases, the balloon expands so that when it gets at altitude, it's over 200 foot across and looks just like an onion. The trickiest part of a balloon ascension, a high altitude balloon ascension, is when you hit the jet stream, when you hit that big gust of wind, which might be a 100 mile an hour wind. And what it tends to do to a huge balloon envelope is as if big fingers are grabbing it and smearing it around. That's the part that you really cross your fingers on. When I went up on man high, uh, I had about a 40 mile an hour wind at, at 40,000 feet. And I looked up at the balloon and it was actually concave from where the wind was hitting it. And it was fluttering, but it didn't, it didn't break, of course. With the jet stream well beneath him, Kittinger and his balloon finally reached maximum altitude. The altimeter read 97,000 feet. He was above 99.9% .9 of the Earth's atmosphere and was the first man in space. One of my radios quit working, so I had to use Morse code, which slowed down the transmission data. But when I ended up at, at 97,000 feet, I had a tenth of a liter of liquid oxygen left, which is not very much. One of the valves had been installed backwards, so it was, it was a challenge to get up and to get down before I ran out of oxygen. After valving off excess helium, Kittinger was able to land safely. He and a handful of other brave scientists continued to make stratospheric balloon flights, researching everything from cosmic rays and the ozone to the limits of human tolerance. The biggest reason why, why a balloon was chosen for a lot of these types of projects was simply the expense. Um, we didn't have a lot of vehicles that could get us up above 100,000 feet. Kittinger made a total of five balloon flights into space. In 1960, as head of Project Excelsior, he piloted a three million cubic foot balloon with an open gondola to a record shattering 102,000 feet. This time the balloon rises more than 14 miles for a jump that will test equipment and procedures for emergency re-entry from outer space. It's a long way down. A camera strapped to Captain Kittinger records these views as he drops 12 miles in three minutes before the chute finally breaks his fall. Not only was Kittinger the first man to break the sound barrier with only his body, but he proved beyond reasonable doubt that a pilot could survive a high-altitude bailout. It wasn't long after that that President Kennedy committed the nation to ambitious and bold goals in space. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. The announcement all but broke the shoestring budgets of the remaining high-altitude balloon programs. Stargazer really was the last gasp of the Air Force. It occurred in 1962, and it was um, an astronomical research flight. The idea was to raise a powerful telescope uh, up into the stratosphere and essentially do astronomy above the haze and the murk and the distortion that we have in our atmosphere. It was the first chance we really had to look at the moon, to look at Mars without the distortion. After the initial launch, Stargazer's balloon, which was three million cubic feet and carried a payload of more than 6,500 pounds, never made it off the ground again. So we had two balloon failures in a row, and uh, the Air Force said, Kettinger, why don't you do something else? So I left, and I went into Vietnam as a result of that. If the central techno-scientific moment of the 20th century was the lunar landing, then we have to say that the maiden voyage for that flight really goes all the way back to the balloonists in the 50s. Flying in a vehicle, there was uh, very little changed from the 18th century. The legacy of the high altitude balloon programs really was an asset in the space program. We would not 
um, certainly have gotten to the moon um, as quickly or as easily without them. Ever since the 19th century, ballooning belonged primarily to the scientists, the military, and the European elite, because lifting gas was so expensive. In Europe, non-flammable helium was 10 times more expensive than highly flammable hydrogen. And in the U.S., nervous gas companies were reluctant to sell balloonists hydrogen, forcing them to use the more expensive helium. But helium and hydrogen balloons had other drawbacks. Both gases are heavy. They may be lighter than air once they fill the balloon, but each steel cylinder of fuel under pressure weighs about 100 pounds, which prohibits balloonists from taking a fuel supply on board. Also, the early rubberized cotton gas balloons were made of heavy material that was easily damaged. They had to be reworked and inspected inside and out for pinholes and everything else after your flight. Ed Yost changed all that by taking the hydrogen and helium out of the balloon and putting propane heated hot air back in, more than 150 years after the Montgolfier brothers. He knew scientific balloons, he knew gas balloons. So his first balloon, his first hot air balloon, was built like a gas balloon. In 1955, Yost built a 27,000 cubic foot polyethylene prototype. The first one I made, I used a white unleaded gas and the burners from plumber's fire pots and ganged them together and got the thing inflated in the air on a string, actually a nylon line, and got some pictures. And I took the pictures back to Washington and showed you off the naval research that you could get a longer flight duration and carry your fire and fuel on board. The Navy commissioned Yost to develop a new balloon that would carry one man and enough fuel for several hours. It had to be small, lightweight, reusable, and inflate quickly. Pretty soon he had the teardrop shape that we see today that every balloon manufacturer in the world uses. And there are stories about how that shape was devised by computer, by submerging rubber envelopes in water, all kinds of magic thing. But what it was was just a good old cut and try. Just do it, improve it, and keep improving it until you've got what works. And uh, the materials, the fabric, he went through the same thing. He went through all the fabrics that were available, uh, Dacron, nylon, Orlon, uh, plastics, uh, arrived at, at nylon. Uh, through a series of experiments. The burners were a problem. Um, I had 14 flame mounts on the fire. And when I had the whole burner exploded in the air, and I hit the ground pretty hard several times. I had a doctor in Sioux Falls named Dr. Frost. <laughs> Every time he saw me coming, he says, Yo, she said he'd worn out three bodies already. <laughs> <laughs> He was a very brave man. I think he was as brave as the Montgolfiers originally. He didn't know what was going to happen. In October of 1960, Yost made the first free flight in a modern hot air balloon. Equipped with a portable propane heater, he flew for 25 minutes and landed three miles from where he started. More importantly, the use of propane, which was both inexpensive and readily available, put ballooning in the hands of everyday adventurers. A balloon flight fueled by propane cost about $20 as compared to $3,000 a flight for helium. The thing that makes the hot air balloon a sport today is the fact that Ed Yost figured out how to do it cheap and portable. He figured out the right materials to use, the right fuel to use, um, and made a, and invented a sport. I don't think Ed Yost intended the hot air balloon to be a sport. I think he intended to be exactly what it was at the time he was fulfilling a military contract by inventing a military tool. It all turned out good. And, you know, uh, not too many years after that, I got a lot of letters from Czechoslovakia and stuff. This was I sent them sketches and plans and stuff, and when they prayed, when that bunch or group from East Germany first made the, their own hot air balloon and escaped, I said, it's all worthwhile. <laughs> oh, goodness. While the Navy eventually lost interest in hot air balloons, Yost was just getting warmed up. 
you don't make much of an impression in the with this machine across the United States and especially South Dakota. <laughs> so if you really want the world to look at this thing, you have to do something that people look at. So Ed Yost and Auguste Picard's nephew, Don Picard, decided to fly a 56,000 cubic foot hot air balloon across the English Channel to demonstrate its capabilities. To get clearance to fly this monster across the English Channel, uh, we had to go to the Department of Transport in London and they didn't knew a damn thing about balloons and uh, especially hot air balloons nobody even heard of one was carried fuel on board in april of 1963 yost and picard took off from england and were immediately forced up to an unfamiliar altitude in search of more favorable winds we stayed at 13,500 feet and i didn't even know if the, the balloon would fly that high or the burners would operate but they did the flight lasted three hours, 17 minutes, and covered a distance of 50 miles. And whether he knew it or not, Ed Yost, the propane pioneer, had just put modern hot air ballooning on the map. The oldest international gas balloon race began in Paris in 1906. The race was conceived and named for James Gordon Bennett, an eccentric millionaire and newspaper publisher. The first race featured 16 balloons from seven countries. The Gordon Bennett race was a great international challenge. These balloons are expensive. It's an expensive sport. A good friend of mine has got the perfect uh, way to train for gas ballooning. You get into the shower and, and turn the water on ice cold and, and get completely soaked. And then you take all the $100 bills you can get and stuff them down the drain. And that's the way you train for flying gas balloons because it's always cold. It frequently rains. Uh, and it, it's a rather, rather expensive uh, pastime, but an awful lot of fun. To this day, the only rule in the Gordon Bennett race is that each competitor must fly the same size balloon, 35,000 cubic feet, and whoever flies the farthest in any direction wins. Joe Kittinger has won the race three times in the Rosie O'Grady, but it wasn't easy. We ended up landing at, at night about 4 o'clock on a desert island called the Guardian Angel Island. And there's no habitation on the island. And it has the highest percentage of rattlesnakes of any place in the world. But the great thing about it was we won the race. Racing is not the only challenge for competitive balloonists. There are world records in 15 different size categories for distance, duration, and altitude. Ed Yost holds many of them. Yeah, I've been doing this for 50 years. I don't know what the hell I'm doing, I think. Ed Yost is the Babe Ruth of balloons. There's nothing he hasn't done. In October of 1976, Yost launched a 60,000 cubic foot helium balloon made of neoprene coated nylon in a solo attempt to cross the Atlantic. He had no sponsors. He did it with his own money. He built the, the entire balloon himself. He built the envelope himself. He built the car underneath it himself. The car was a sailboat, so that if he had to go down in the water, he would be in a boat. The only thing that failed during the whole flight was his alarm clock, which he bought in a drugstore. And the alarm clock was to wake him up, of course, so he, he could uh, sleep in small uh, portions. And the alarm clock broke, so he repaired the alarm clock while he was in flight. My objective was to get all the world records, and I made 2,475 miles on a great circle course on this very small balloon. That's farther than Los Angeles and New York City. And I was near four and a half days alone. Nobody fight me. Yost landed 200 miles east of the Azores and set distance and duration records for that size balloon that still stand today. Everybody said, why don't you do it again? I said, well, I did one, and that's enough. I did cross the ocean, but... If I had crossed the ocean, I'd have lost a lot of business because that was a challenge. So then I started getting telephone calls. One of the first calls Yost got was from Max Anderson and Ben Abruzzo, a couple of businessmen turned hot air balloonists who wanted to try and cross the Atlantic by gas balloon. There was just one problem. I trained them to fly. Uh, I went to Amarillo, Texas, and they came over, and I took uh, plastic balloons and taught them to fly in September of 1977, Anderson and Abruzzo launched a 101,000 cubic foot Yost built balloon from Massachusetts. The trajectory on Double Eagle One was horrible because they went clear up in the Arctic and damn near frozen to death in that operation. Severe winds blew them off course, 
65 hours after they began, the double eagle ditched into the sea three miles off the coast of Iceland. Defrosting their resolve, the men decided to try it again. This time, they would add another aviator, Larry Newman. The stories he told me about their flight, uh, they were enlightening. I don't want to say they were thrilling. It was more like a horror story. But I was intrigued with the actual difficulty in the adventure of long-distance ballooning. The harsh reality of long-distance balloon flights across the Atlantic was sobering. Since 1873, there had been a total of 14 attempts and five deaths. The crew of the Double Eagle II had only one guarantee. I guarantee the balloon they don't pay for it until I prove it takeoff. I inflate this plane and bring it into equilibrium, hold it about six feet in the air, and let it sit there for a half hour, and it will, if it has any leak any place, it will come right down to the ground. I guarantee there's no leak. On August 11th, 1978, Double Eagle II, an 11-story leak-free 160,000 cubic foot nylon balloon, launched from Presque Isle, Maine, with no other guarantees of survival. The idea was to surf in front of a high-pressure front which would carry the balloon along on a mass of air. The balloon took off four hours late. So we missed being in front of it and rode essentially on the backside like a surfer would be on the backside of a wave instead of in front of the wave. Not a great place to surf. As it turned out, uh, we missed the stronger winds that would have averaged 40 or 50 miles an hour and I believe we only moved about 25 miles per hour. We ought to check off so let's go to 100% and see that we got it both. So the stress was extreme knowing that any moment we could go in the ocean which we almost did uh, at one portion of the flight. The gondola which measured six and a half feet by six feet was recycled from Double Eagle One after it was fished out of the sea near Iceland. We built a sleeping box that was insulated, which was very fortunate because of the temperatures at night. And it was filled with essentials for survival. The one unique thing about ballooning compared to any other form of flight, it's a still environment. So once the balloon moves up off the ground and it's now able to drift, any wind that was on the ground as you were standing in the gondola is gone. Because the balloon is empty inside, it acts as an amplifier. And so from 20,000 feet above the ocean, you can hear things on the water. We could actually hear small objects we would drop, hit the water 20,000 feet below us. Ben and I had a discussion over the ocean that maybe we would land and there wouldn't be anybody there, so we'd have to hide the gondola somewhere under some trees and go to a payphone and call and have somebody come and pick us up. Yes, the Bad Eagle 2, here we are the French TV, and we welcome you into French space. When we landed, there were approximately 5,000 people showed up within 10 minutes. Balloonists had been trying to cross the Atlantic for 150 years. On August 17, 1978, Six days and 2,950 miles after launch, the crew landed in France and in the record books. In 1981, Larry Newman and Ben Abruzzo went on to successfully cross the Pacific in Double Eagle 5. That balloon was still the very basic balloon that was flown back in the 1700s. It was just a gas balloon. Now there's all these combinations, rosiers, this, that, pressurization, etc., etc., the more things we have that are complex, the more things there are to, to break down. And so this was still simple technology. Simple balloon technology kept Joe Kittinger alive. As a prisoner of war in Vietnam, Kittinger survived extended periods of solitary confinement by taking flights of fancy. Everybody had their own little ways of, of entertaining themselves and keeping their minds active. And that was mine, was how to fly around the world in a balloon. Almost eight years after Ed Yost's record-setting flight, Kittinger launched a solo attempt to cross the Atlantic. I made the balloon for him, 84,000 cubic feet, quite a bit large, about 50%. The balloon's size itself 
was restricted to going above 22,000 feet. So that's basically where I flew. And it was cold, and it was minus 20 or so, degrees below zero. After flying for three and a half freezing days, Kittinger landed in Italy, establishing a new distance record and accomplishing something that had never been done before, crossing the Atlantic in a balloon, solo. The reason why you do something like that is just for fun. If I couldn't, after the fact, get together with Sherry and have a glass of champagne and get my buddies and thank them, who'd want to do it? You do it because of people and association and friends. Today, most balloonists are in it for fun. With the advent of propane burners and nylon fabrics in the 60s, hot air ballooning has become more popular than ever. In 1964, there were six hot air balloons registered with the FAA. Currently, there are more than 8,500. In Europe, there it's more clubby. The, uh, the balloons are owned by uh, large groups, uh, 20, 30 uh, member clubs. But in the United States, most hot air balloons are owned by individuals and they're flown for fun. Nothing is more spectacular or fun than the Albuquerque International Balloon Fiesta, the largest balloon event in the world. In 1972, there were just 13 balloons and 10,000 spectators in a shopping center parking lot. Today, there are almost 900 balloons and more than a million spectators. There are several innovative contests for balloonists, including a key grab, an event in which pilots position their balloons in an effort to grab the keys to a brand new truck. Oh my God, there goes my truck! Without exception, the most popular event is the Special Shape Rodeo, a jaw-dropping, eye-opening, heart-pumping display of the most colorful and creative crafts to float through the sky. It wasn't until 1976 that the conventional balloon got a facelift. These big, benevolent bags of air are an amalgamation of commercialism and the technological advances in computers. An enduring icon, the Energizer Bunny, is also one of the tallest hot air balloons in the world. 160 feet in length, the ears alone stand 60 feet high. The complex shape of these balloons make them especially difficult to fly because they're awkward aerodynamically. But even that seems to be just another challenge for the adventure-charged balloonists. The Albuquerque International Balloon Fiesta is considered the most photographed event on the planet. Balloons will return on modern marvels. From the very beginning, balloons have engaged the human imagination. That fascination has led to some innovative uses of the vehicle. A painter in France tried to use a balloon as scaffolding. In Oregon, helium-filled balloons were used to harvest trees in inaccessible areas. In 1960, the first communications balloon satellite was launched a thousand miles into space. And in 1966, the first balloon hospital was shipped to the jungles of South Vietnam. Equipped with expandable operating rooms, the structure could be collapsed and loaded into a helicopter in less than 15 minutes. Balloons are also used by the National Weather Service, which flies 80,000 of them each year to gather up-to-the-minute atmospheric information on relative humidity, temperature, and pressure. Approximately six feet in diameter, the balloons fly to an altitude of 100,000 feet before bursting. Historically, balloons have never failed to reinvent themselves or attract attention. Their uncanny resilience is due in part to their simplicity. The advantage of the balloon is that uh, it's quite simple. It doesn't involve complex moving parts. We use almost every kind of, of, of balloon design that has been conceived to date, and we've invented a few besides. NASA began sending up unmanned high-altitude balloons in the 70s when scientists started looking at alternatives to get their experiments into space. Space on uh, rockets and satellites was a uh, premium, and so they're looking for other vehicles. And balloons end up being a real viable way to, uh, to do good science. The cost is, is uh, just a fraction of, of what it would cost to put a, a rocket up. The average stratospheric polyethylene balloon is 40 million cubic feet, or about 20 acres of plastic. 
They are capable of carrying scientific payloads of up to 8,000 pounds and can fly up to 26 miles above the Earth. On takeoff, they could be as tall as the Washington Monument, and once they reach float altitude and the gas inside expands, the balloon is as wide as two 747 jumbo jets, nose to tail. Flights last from a couple of days to a couple of weeks, but NASA plans to change all that. We've got new materials these days, and they instituted a new program called Ultra Long Duration Ballooning. The goal of that program is to provide a balloon system that will take uh, 2,000 pounds of science up to 120,000 feet and put it there for 100 days. While ultra-long duration balloon flights will be commonplace in the new century, new materials will also allow balloons to fly into space. The new space balloons are made of plastic that is 10 times stronger than steel and can tolerate temperatures of 600 degrees Fahrenheit. Today, we're now seeing the Balloons can be used in uh, planetary research and exploring the seven other planets in the solar system that have atmospheres. NASA plans to launch its first interplanetary aerobot or robotic balloon by rocket in 2003. Now what you're seeing here is the spacecraft approaching Mars. The probe now floats down towards the surface of Mars and uh, right about now the, the balloon will be deployed. You can see the, uh, the balloon here taking pictures of the surface. It will last for up to about three months in the atmosphere. And uh, it'll float in the prevailing winds across the surface uh, at a few miles high. Unlike their earthly predecessors, interplanetary balloons and payloads are measured in pounds, not tons. The gondola on the Mars balloon weighs just four and a half pounds. The real advantage of the balloon is that it's a thousand times closer than, a, than an orbiter, an orbiter in space. Uh, but it's a thousand times higher above the surface than a rover, and so it has a much greater perspective. Every idea comes round again. There are very few ideas in the, in, in, in the world, and, and certainly this is the case here, but I think what you have to really look at here is why is this happening now? On the one hand, the need to explore, the fact we're exhausting the potential of what we can do with uh, orbital vehicles, with rovers. We have to have a new way of exploring the planets. At the same time, technology is helping us with the miniaturization of electronics and sensors. It means that very small balloons are feasible, and the fact that the revolution in materials is allowing us to build very lightweight balloon envelopes that can carry an, uh, comparatively large payload fractures. Like all of the balloons before them, the interplanetary robotic balloons are unsteerable, lighter than air bags with no brakes and no way to propel themselves. These balloons are scheduled to enter the atmosphere of Venus and Titan, a moon of Saturn in 2005. A simple device that first lifted man off the face of the Earth more than 200 years ago. The balloon will now elevate his understanding of the cosmos.